our feet. All right, well, while everybody starts joining us, I always like to ask a fun icebreaker question. Um, and so since we have uh, Tracy King on with us today, and uh, we all know that she's a fantastic leader, I'm going to ask you a question about leadership. Is that okay? Yes, here we go. <laughs> What's the best piece of professional advice you've been given? Um, it's so simple. Okay. Don't be the person afraid to ask questions. And I think it was the longer answer would be, I was in a meeting with a boss at the time and I left wondering what everybody was talking about. And I turned to my boss and asked, what was that about? And he said, I had no idea. And I realized, you know, if you're, there's other people like you. And then I was telling someone else and they said, so start asking because clearly, you know, you're, everyone's missing out. And so I think from showing the interest of learning and stop thinking about what it makes you look like makes you more, um, I guess, balanced in the sense of people feel like you're more approachable and easier to relate to as well. And that just kind of naturally progresses from there. Hey, I like it. Rob, I color coordinated with the picture behind you. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I'm glad uh, I'm glad you worked that out ahead of time, Melissa. <laughs> I'm the what neutral about... base between the two. Yeah. What about you? What's the professional, what's the best professional advice Rob Christman has ever been given? Uh, yeah, uh -oh. can't go broke taking a profit. <laughs> uh, uh, look both ways before you cross the street. Okay. I don't. Uh, I don't know as I <clears throat> received much professional advice to tell you the truth. Okay. I should have. I should have been thinking of an answer while uh, Tracy was talking about. It. Uh, <laughs> yeah, stay away from. Stay away from <laughs> airport dogs. That's. Uh, yeah, stay away from. Uh, try to. Uh, grab a, a celebrity who's uh, milling around here. Um, I can't, I, you know, I just do your job and mind your business. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. All right. All right. I will put Tracy, you on Tracy had a much better answer than I had. Such a leader. <laughs> such a great leader. Mind your business. Keep going. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Also, don't watch the movie Cocaine Bear. That is a really good piece of advice. <laughs> that will follow us forever, Rob. What? What was? What? Melissa? What'd you say? Don't watch the movie Cocaine Bear. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, words to live by. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off. Um, Happy Friday, everybody. I'm Melissa Langdale. I'm the president and CEO of the Mortgage Collaborative. Uh, we are thrilled that you are spending your Friday day with us and that Rob's cat Myrtle is spending uh, her Friday with us as well. And um, so we are going to kick things off. Uh, Tracy King, you are the COO of Partners Credit <laughs> Verification. I'm so I, How do I compete with this? <laughs> if uh, I could bend down and pick up my pit bull, I would. But <laughs> She's lounging to the side, but anyone that's been on a Zoom call with me before know that she's usually perched behind me at times and putting a paw on my head, but I've seen not too. today. That's the cutest, but thank you for joining us, Tracy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, well, you know, to kind of kick things off, um, you know, not everybody knows Partners Credit like I do and Rob does. Uh, why don't you give them kind of a brief overview of what makes you guys unique? We're a credit reporting agency, so I'm sure everybody has one. Everybody loves them, right? Uh, and uh, we provide all the services from pre-qualification to post-loan, QC, uh, all your verification solutions kind of all wrapped into one. Um, what makes us different, you know, we like to, uh, especially these days when we're going to be talking about today, we talk about pricing. Anyone can kind of go in and... Um, say, okay, well, what are you paying now? We'll pay it a dollar cheaper. Um, but there's a difference between someone that sits down and talks to you and analyzes what you're doing on a quarterly, yearly, whatever you want basis and kind of understands your processes. So for me and my team, 
we're truly dedicated to finding out, you know, how you're doing it, why you're doing it, and if there's alternative solutions. And then also we have our own proprietary technology. So with that, we try to offer different technology solutions as well as, as the market changes and development needs change. We try to get on top of that as quickly as possible. So that's my elevator pitch, as Rob would say. I love it. So, so what is, uh, you know, we, I'm sure we're going to get into some issues here, Tracy, but, you know, there's a lot of negative out there. Uh, but I want to ask you, given, given your elevator pitch, do, does partners have anything coming that your clients can get excited about or look forward to? Um, we're always working on different solutions. And I think the biggest thing right now is people are looking at different controls and guardrails they can have on their processes. And so we're implementing a lot of, um, you know, working with different LOS systems to automate certain processes. So when you're ordering specific products and making sure you're not doing it too early, too late for compliance purposes, that you're ordering it once and not duplicating orders. I think everyone's kind of looking at how we can, you know, control some of these situations and take it out of the hands of people to make errors. So that's something that we're working on um, currently and also continuing to add um, solutions to our, our tech stack with VOEs. There's constant movement with that, um, looking at different solutions for VOAs. So we're always trying to add, you know, yes. That, that's a very corporate statement. Can you narrow that down? Add solutions to our tech stack. What does well, that, what does I that mean, mean? There's always there's always things coming up. There's always new solutions coming out in our industry. We really try to look at what works for customers, what makes sense, and then how do we simplify that? So as always, you look at all these different vendors. Vendor management is difficult. It's expensive. Managing different invoices is difficult. It's expensive. So we try to consolidate and look at what is something that we can offer where, you know, customers don't have to worry about minimums if they go through a third party service. So um, VOEs is an issue. It's super expensive. Now, there was always the work number, and that was the only solution. Now there's Experian Verified. Now there's um, several Proof. other. And again, yeah, there's all these to prove Argyle, all of this. So we're trying to look at different solutions and how we can add them into our system to cascade, to hit the different um, solutions, starting with the cheapest, so that you don't automatically have to go to the most expensive and you don't have to waste a processor's time going to all these things, trying to find it, asking you to use your credit card so that they can input it to get the information we're trying to simplify it, streamline it, what makes sense, test it out, um, and also utilize our other customers' feedback so that we can provide it to others saying, you know, we've implemented Experian Verified. We've seen that it kind of works in one region better than the other, but it could reduce the usage of the work number by 10%, which could add up ultimately to your invoice. So is that better? Is that less corporate? Kind of. Yeah, it, it immediately launched into the world of Melissa in terms of technology. Um, you asked. Yeah, I, still, I still have my flip phone, so you went way over my head. But right. on a more psychological level, I thought of a question while you were talking. And so you that weren't did, listening necessarily to the answer. Yeah, I was, okay. kind of. Mm -hmm. What were you saying? Can you repeat that? <laughs> um, no, what... You know, you, you talk about all these things that are going on kind of behind the scenes. And I think a lot of vendors are doing a lot of those similar things, right? You know, trying trying to help their client, trying to trying to be relevant, trying to trying to look a little bit into the future and, and and help their clients. You've been on the front line in terms of dealing with vendor management personnel or companies. And credit reporting agencies have really taken it on the chin here in the last year in terms of uh, re negotiating contracts and negotiating, you know, prices and so on. And, and I'm sure uh, any vendor who's on the call here hasn't had much fun, uh, you know, dealing with somebody who's, you know, paying $5 a widget and they want it for four because the competitor is offering it for four and everybody's trying to save money. If you were a lender, 
knowing what you know, how would you approach a vendor in terms of renegotiating that? Maybe not necessarily re renegotiating the five dollars down to four dollars per widget, but how would you approach? What's the, what's the best way for a lender to approach a vendor, and that you know that lender's looking for, you know, trying trying to figure out ways to save money. Yeah, I mean, I think all the, the vendors on this call have been through the ringer, especially CRAs. Um, I think the most frustrating thing to me is we recognize that everyone is in, I might say, a bit of a panic mode when it comes to the bottom line. And whereas sometimes they're too busy to kind of work through with their existing vendors what's going on, someone might grab their attention with something else. And suddenly they're like, oh, well, um, I didn't, that looks so much better. And that seems <laughs> like a wonderful deal and immediately start down this path before checking with existing partners, if they offer that, um, or if it actually is as good as it seems. I mean, just today you sent me an article and things we were going to talk about. Yeah. That one snapshot seemed like it had the answer and it would grab someone's attention, but if you go deeper into layers, then you can see that the bottom line is still the same and or that it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors. Um, my dogs just saw a squirrel, so I might mute in a second and let you take something away. But um, but I just went back from a, a meeting with a customer in which they came in and said, look at what they're offering us. You know, where have you been on this? And when I went through kind of line by line and explained the way that they were doing it they were actually going to pay more. So I think it's make time for the vendors that exist um, because it does cost a lot of money to change. Um, and also on the other side of it is that if you're not getting new solutions from your current vendors, then yeah, it is time to look. I know what it means trying to get in the door. And I, I think it goes both ways. Is It's important to have the conversation rather than, you know, kind of something pulling you in. If it seems too good to be true, it most likely is. I want to take a step back just for a quick second, because I'm not sure that everybody understands what's really driving the cost of credit reports. Um, and, and in some cases, verification services up right now. Could you like fill us in on what you feel like is, is driving a lot of that? I mean, the majority is the FICO score that has jumped up two years ago and everybody kind of has felt that and heard about it for now, but I don't think, you know, the scale of what that looks like, um, we all felt it going into 2023. Um, and that was, you know, with the credit bureaus, the bureaus provide the CRAs with pricing increases every year. Um, the likes of which we hadn't seen an increase like we did in 23 since trend of data came out, but even that was, um, pretty minute compared to this. Um, and then in 2024, where everyone was getting very excited about the prequals, their prices skyrocketed. Again, that was a FICO increase. So within the credit report are different costs and fees that go along with it. So the bureaus will come to us and say, here's what our cost is. Here's what FICO's cost is. Here's, you know, there's all these other little ancillary fees um, and that ultimately leads to this because we're charged by bureau and each bureau comes up with their own price and they're making profits on FICO as well. So um, from there, that's the cost that we're given. And then we have to determine what that looks like for our borrower or for our, our lenders. Will the transition from tri-merge to bi-merge kind of help, like the addition of Vantage score into the FICO mix? Do you think that'll help with pricing any? Um, <laughs> This is my doom and gloom. You had your crystal ball, and I know I'm asking you to. <laughs> no, I think the big question is, and at MBA, I asked this to the panel that was speaking there, and everybody around me was into the question, and the panel said, great question. We'll, we're looking into it. And the point is, even with a buy merge, there's still a time frame in which there's going to be a FICO 10 score, FICO 10 T score, and a Vantage score. Um, so you're going to need two of each. So uh, with that, then 
who's paying for the additional scores during that time. So with that, no one has said anything about what the pricing structure will look like. And that is uh, TBD. So that's a huge question for all of us to be asking. And some might say that this huge increase might be prepping for that, where they're going to be giving both scores. And if they're going to be doing it at the same cost as they are now, maybe this is the cushion to do so. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of questions around the tri-merge to bi-merge transition, right? There's some Humda related questions um, and, and uh, just all sorts of layers. I mean, as you think about that transition, what, I don't know, what makes you the most nervous? That's a really like large, you could go in a bunch of different directions with that. Okay. Rob's, Rob's got a different question. No, no, no. So along those lines, what I've heard, Tracy, maybe you can address this. <laughs> is that the going from tri merge to bi merge? If if I have three options, I'm gonna I'm gonna still run all three and use the two that's gonna give my borrower the best advantage. Is that right. is that the case? No, because the bi merge is optional at first, and then um, they do state in their handbook that. If you pull all three, you still have to submit with all three. So that actually leads really greatly into uh, Melissa's question of what my concerns are for it is the whole implementation of it. Who is in charge of assessing if at some point a tri-merge was pulled and then they pulled a bi-merge right afterwards and want to use those scores, who's regulating how or when or which scores were used. Is that on the CRAs? And then also, you know, all the different pieces that have to be in place in order to make this work. The LOS system, POS systems, our system, um, all of this, there's it's so many layers. But with that, it it comes with where are the the protection around if people are utilizing it properly. So in the FHFA to the uneducated came out two or three weeks ago and said, everybody stand down for a little while. This isn't going to happen until the fourth quarter of 2025. Am I, did I read that wrong? Well, I don't think they said stand down. I think it was a bit of, um, this is exciting. We're moving forward. And it kind of made it seem something that it wasn't a little bit. So there's a playbook that they put out there. The first playbook said the buy merge was happening Q1 of 2024. What they said is now we're implementing and, and looking at all this historical data and kind of muddled all the words together to make, make it sound something more than it was other than a delay to the end of um, Q4 2025. So there is time. Um, I think they're kind of trying to make it seem more exciting, even though there's a delay and keep people's interest. Um, and I think that they're listening more and more and having more of these stakeholder meetings and trying to get people involved with. There's a, um, there's some kind of ID. Aren't we all supposed to get some kind of ID, ID government identification? Oh, the real ID? Are you talking about? Yeah. Hasn't that been delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed? Yes. Yeah. The buy merge is the real ID of the mortgage. Um, okay. Okay. So are we going to, are you going to be called mm -hmm. upon various talk shows around the nation, various uh -huh. conferences to talk about this for the next two years, the same kind of going through the same thing? Right. I'm just going to say, stop freaking out. It's coming, but we have time. I think that's probably what it's going to be. Um, yeah, I think that it it is going to be a lot of that, and um, we're we're slow. Someone just said, "Why is it so resistant to change?" It's you know, I always think about this: is that we want so many things to change, but we're all guilty of being resistant to change for it. And I think everyone sees it within their own companies of trying to adopt new strategies, and you want to appease your top producers that have always done it the way that they've done it. So. It's it's a difficult ship to move, and there's a lot of criteria. I mean, you think about we've had the same scoring model for over a decade, um, if not more. And so to think about 
shifting that and what that could do and all the the technicalities around that of how it can impact the country um it's pretty huge well as in any We're change always there's always questions about the full impact of it H have we really answered every question have we really you know thought about every scenario that could go wrong or co could go different right by by implementing this change and um I think that's what a lot of people are there there's just so many questions that they don't have answers to yeah and it causes trepidation right and it you know <laughs> I'm sorry Rob no, 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 no. I'm just going to say, when you talk to investors and, and, you know, my background is capital markets. And when you get into capital markets, you're talking about, you know, foreclosures and delinquencies and problems with loan files and problems with borrowers and uh, early payoff, whatever it might be. And, but when you talk to investors now, they are looking at a trillions of dollars of mortgages that have been well underwritten and well appraised and the borrowers have the ability to repay do you ever get the question if it's not broken why fix it well i think that the way that they're you know their announcement of this of even vantage and what they're pushing is that this is going to reach borrowers that were unreachable previously and that's the big sell is that it's looking at under funded borrowers um, you're bringing in a whole new pool. The It looks at minorities in terms of their ability to get a loan. And Vantage is a little bit more um, vocal, I think, about what their expectations are of how many new borrowers they're going to be able to reach. But it's it's also looking at how we rate borrowers. And, you know, trended data was, like I said, it was brought about, I, I believe, five, six years ago. Um, and now what the new models do, both of them is saying it's looking at that trend of data and looking more at the trend of the borrower and that it could potentially raise that borrower's score. And also it's bringing in new kind of um, debt in terms of um, landlords, utility bills, as long as they're reported to the bureaus. So that, because I mean, I guess that's a, it's a, it's a complicated answer because it is, you know, it is supposed to reach more borrowers, but it's a different type of borrower, a different type of loan. And what do we actually have out there right now for those borrowers, which is, you know, the never ending question about inventory and the, <laughs> I know your favorite, and also, you know, what the, the median uh, house price is right now. That's exactly, that's exactly what I was going to ask next or, or or mention next is is that the cynics will say we don't need more qualified borrowers we need more properties or, and more starter homes that they can buy right because a cynic far be it for me to put on my cynic hat right. but they will say you know unless we're building more homes all more borrowers do or more potential borrowers do is bid up the price of the starter home inventory, once again, moving it out of reach potentially for, for borrowers. But right. I'm not cynical, so I'm not gonna say that out loud. No, never you, you were never cynical. And Ira brought up a good, he asked about FHA, um, that they aren't on board yet, but they did make an announcement, I believe in February, saying that they are looking into um, the buy merge with interest. So, um, that is, you know, in their yeah. has the, been uh, talking with them to you and and both FHA VA, USDA, Jenny May has all said that they were gonna they were gonna do their best to work hand in hand um and and you know try to roll out everything at the same time for for yeah. the least amount of impact it, on the industry. VA VA came up today in some of my emails regarding the NAR, NAR not NRA, NAR settlement. And what impact, you know, how is the VA going to react to that? Because when you look at buyers, uh, buyers, agents, commissions, and VA non-allowances, uh, I don't know if that question has been answered yet. But yeah, all the all the uh, all my telegraph lines have been burning up with regard to this settlement, which I think works out to about ten dollars per home buyer over the last, you know, several decades. You know, I don't know how they came up with this dollar amount, but, and I don't even know who's getting the money. If I bought a house in the last 20 years, do I get 
fifteen dollars and eighty cents from this? Who has the answers to these things? I, I think I think there's a a, a hundred and eight page to. for 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 lenders and vendors who want to follow it. I think there's like this hundred and eight page document that's coming out. But I think the and we're really changing subjects, Tracy. So I'm sorry to to but we only have uh, four or five minutes left here. The 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 mortgage companies are looking at this settlement saying, okay, how can we get ahead of our competitors in terms of looking at the settlement and advising our real estate partners, uh, you know, our, our real estate partners, listen to me, so corporate, but, you know, the real estate agents that we work with telling them about this settlement and how it may impact them and how, if, if at all, it impacts us. And I think that's a, uh, that's going to be, you know, required weekend reading for many people in our industry. Yeah. I, I think there's still a lot that has to come out on it, obviously. Um, th there is, you know, it, they haven't said that like buyer's agent commissions are not going to be approved at all. It just says that they can't be listed in MLS and there can't be NAR guidance around it. Um, so I, I'll be interested. I mean, it's, you know, with we talked about this a second ago with inventory challenges, affordability challenges. I, you know, it'll be interesting to see the the impact uh, this has on on that. I mean, it's not not opening up inventory if if uh, people have to, uh, or it's not. If, I don't know. I, I, it might increase the the cost of home or cost of uh, home buying. Maybe the tax credit would that offset it? Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know the answer. I, I'm not read the, the document, but there there is a school of thought out there that says, just like we had the LO comp rule impacting loan officers and, and lenders, this could easily uh, be something that directly impacts the real estate community, and they have to come up with the solutions and paths right. to navigate this themselves. But we as an industry can help can can be there and help educate them, but um, you know, like I said, I think some lenders are looking at this as an opportunity to be a leader to their to their real estate agent clients and say, okay, let's let's figure this out together and further solidify that relationship. All right, um, still lots of questions to be. I don't know sought in, in that lawsuit and how it's going to impact our industry and how, you know, uh, loan officers, for example, may be able to, to come along beside their agents and help them to navigate. Well, yeah. Just, I, I bought a house in the last 20 years. I, I want my check for thousands of dollars. I can hardly thousands wait. Of dollars? Thousands. Okay. Did you ever, uh, uh, changing gears entirely again, Melissa, did you ever see that commercial with uh, Sean White? As a loan officer, Sean White, the the skier guy, snowboarder, no. snowboarder. I knew That's it fun. involved ice. It's pretty funny. Okay, I'm I'm gonna go look it up after this. <laughs> yeah. Do you, anyway. Do you want to describe it to everybody else who doesn't know what what it is? No, nah, it's best to go to YouTube and I think it was a Conan O'Brien uh, fake commercial for for some loan company and Sean White is talking snowboarder slang and how he's going to save every borrower thousands. Oh, you know, okay. That's save save thousands of dollars. So I thought it was, funny. I thought it was my ears, but now I know it was a, a complete reference to something that was real. That's great. <laughs> All right. Do you have one last question for Tracy? Do I? I don't know. Did anything come up in the chat that, that you could use? People were really excited about the real ID stuff. I think that was the highlight yes. of our um, conversation. Real ID. It's just more big brother, lack of privacy. Don't get me started. Oh, here we go. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, happy Friday, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, and Tracy, thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon and sharing your insights into the credit world as well as the market with us. We we appreciate it. And um, <laughs> Angie, uh, thank you, Angie. Um, we are excited to uh, to see you guys again next week. We have a special rundown that is right before our conference in Louisville. Uh, David Kittle and myself are going to 
uh, be joined with Rob uh, and we have some fun, fun things to discuss there. So looking forward to seeing you guys all next week. And Aren't you doing that from a golf course, Melissa? Rob. There you go. Oh, there he is. She came to say hi. Okay. That's Betty. I can't, I can't do the whole, I can't pick her up all the way, but. Love it. Um, maybe, maybe it might be from a golf course. We're going to see. We're, uh, we're going to. Imagine David Kittle being on a golf course. <laughs> well, between the two of I us. Imagine you. You being on a golf course. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We'll see. All right. Well, we'll we'll surprise everybody next week. Maybe people can guess which course we're going to be at. Um all right. everybody in Kentucky. Yep. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, see you guys again next week and have a good weekend. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Tracy, thanks for joining us again. Thank you Thank guys. You. Have a good one. Right. Bye, everybody. Cheers.